Hey guys, I want to do a video this evening, and this is going to be probably either the most fascinating video you've seen on my channel thus far, or the craziest, and you're going to think I'm off my rocker, but I never back down from trying to find the truth, and whether it's in the sciences or from history, I want to know if this world is telling us the truth or not, and we know for a fact that God is true and every man is a liar. And we've seen history rewritten many, many times in our lifetime. And I want to delve into something and show you some things that I've been looking at for the past few weeks, if not uh, months. And this has really been on my mind lately. And you know, I guess just, this is really not going to have many Bible verses in it. This is going to, going to be a study. I'm going to show you some things that I found, but um, I guess to kick this video off, hopefully it won't be too long, I do want to show a couple of short video clips within this video uh, to get my point across on the topic of this video, which I'm about to tell you. But let me start with Daniel 7, and I'm going to read four verses, verses 23 through 26. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion, to consume and to destroy it unto the end. So here, we see Daniel receiving a revelation and its prophecy of end times events. And specifically, this passage is prophesying of the end times kingdom and the Antichrist that shall arise out of that kingdom. Now, in verse 25, it says that the Antichrist will think to change times and laws. And I may do a whole nother video about this, about what I think this is talking about. But for this video, I want us to concentrate on changing time. And this video is about changing time. But we know that there are many antichrists as we speak and have been throughout history. Quoting 1 John 2.18, it says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So, I don't think that this verse simply applies to the end times of end times, when the Antichrist shall arise, but can also apply to the end times since Christ that we are in now and spiritual wickedness in high places causing evil men to do things in the sense that it can be the spirit of Antichrist. Looking at Daniel 7.25, this includes changing times and laws. For this video, I want to look specifically at the changing of time. And I want to show that I believe that the Dark Ages or Middle Ages, as we see here, the Dark Ages is a categorization commonly used to describe the period between the fall of the Roman Empire and the beginning of the Italian Renaissance and the age of exploration, roughly speaking, the Dark Ages corresponds to the Middle Ages, are from 500 AD to 
1500 AD, a thousand years in the middle of our modern civilization are known as the Dark Ages. We don't know much about it. There's not a lot recorded. There's not a lot of archaeological finds, artifacts, documents, anything related to this time period. Why is that? So I started delving in it to some delving into it some more. And I'm going to show you a couple of videos. But I don't think the dark ages existed. I think that a thousand years has been added to our calendar. And I believe that we are not 2000 years since Christ, but 1000 years since Christ, give or take a few years. And let me show you some videos and then show you some more evidence to make my point. I want to start with this video. It is, I'm going to play the first five minutes or so. Let's get into the details of how the history of a full planet was shifted, for example, with a thousand years back in time. In the Middle Ages, people used to write years in a different way, not the way we write them now. There were two ways in the Middle Ages to write the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. One was Jesus and the other one was Christos. And when people meant that a certain event happened 300 years after Jesus Christ, they placed an I in front of the number of the year. An alternative version was to place the letter X and that originated from the name Christos because that is how, till nowadays, the Slavic people call our Savior Jesus Christ. For example, Ludovici Elisevira is considered by the mainstream historians to be a Renaissance publisher. However, as we can see on their own emblem, the year is 595. Before this year, we see the letter I and a dot after it. This is obviously not the number one. Another example, according to the mainstream history, this is 1521. However, if you pay attention, this is clearly the letter I. This is not the number one. And it is separated with dots. Another example. This is interpreted nowadays as year 1656. However, we can see that it actually has the letter I instead of one. And the year written is 656. There were different handwriting styles of writing the letter I. Here is another one from Germany. This is year 658. However, it is interpreted nowadays as 1658. Same on the next example. This is from Nuremberg, Germany. And again, there is no doubt that this is year 699 and there is a letter I in front of it. This is not the number one. One was never written in this way. While the previous writing was before the introduction of the ideas of Scaliger, this is the same location, but the paintings are from the 18th century. And here we see how the letter I has been substituted with the number 1, and in this way the history was prolonged with 1000 years. There are endless examples that this is not 1, it is the letter I.
In some cases, the letter I, or in Slavic, the letter X, was completely omitted. Like, for example, on this map, the cartographer clearly, absolutely clearly writes that this is something referring to year 740 and 750, and yet the mainstream historians conveniently place, place it uh, in year 1000. 740 and 1750. And this is not the only such example. This is an old emblem of the city of Vilnius. It is absolutely clearly written on it, 7th century. And yet, according to the mainstream history, this is city of the Middle Ages. You can click on link number 7 for more examples and much more details. At this point, you probably wonder, but how did it work in reality? How did the common people, for example, in year 600 after Christ, all of a sudden start thinking that it is now 1600 after Christ. Actually, the common people didn't even understand what happened because conveniently, exactly at that time, the calendar was changed. The new Gregorian calendar was introduced and everything was set to the so-called correct dates. And because it was all done centrally on paper, the common people on the street did not understand what's going on at all. In this way, the history, the way you know it, appeared. It was not created by historians, but by illusionists, trickster, circus-style magicians. So I'll stop there and just summarize briefly that five and a half minute video. So what she is saying is that after Christ, the most significant event in world history, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, people began over time to date documents, coins, just anything from year to year, just keeping track of time based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the I is for Isis because there was no J until roughly late 1500s, early 1600s. And I'll show you some examples of this change um, in a minute. But basically, they denoted the time with an I in front of the year. So if it was 300 years after the resurrection of Christ, they would denote that I-300 for Jesus. Isis, the year of the Lord, 300. So at the end, I don't know if you caught that um, quickly how she summarized how everybody was fooled and how can nobody catch on to this. Well, I'll go into this in more detail and I'll probably make another video showing the chronology um, of all this, but in 1582, according to the current chronology, Pope Gregory the 13th introduced the Gregorian calendar. And so people went from the Julian calendar, typically most cultures in Europe at least use that based on a lunar um, date to a solar date of the Gregorian calendar. He added a few days to make up for lost time. But at that same time, what I think happened was instead of this, I think happened around 582, the I was changed to a one based on the new calendar. And so all of a sudden, everybody began to not bad an eye when things were referred to or dated as 1582. It was just a new calendar that came in and they thought that was the way it was. Um, let me stop here and show you another video. Comes from here. Here medieval English engraving dated supposedly in the year 1463. 
look good. You'll see the first digit of the unit, unit of measure, E, 1000, is not a figure, and the Latin letter I, exactly the same as the letter to the left of the word D and I. Incidentally, the Latin inscription Anno Domino means the birth of Christ, abbreviated as ADI. So when you see ADI, it means birth of Christ, and ADX of the Christ. Therefore, the date written on the engraving is not 1463, but is 463 years of Jesus, the birth of Christ. And there's your Anno Domini. That is an I, but it's not a one. Okay. So this one here looks like it is I. Um, I can't read it. I'm sure he has it blown up. Let me go down here and look. Yep. There you go. I-515. Exactly the same as in the author's monogram. IGB, Johansson, Baldug, Green, and the number... One is written differently. You can see this is an I. This is the one. And this is his monogram, IGB. So this I and this I match. So the date of this engraving is not 1515, but 515 years of Christmas after Christ. And here you can see is another one. Same impression. This one here, to me, looks like an I or a soft J or a 2. Okay, Muscovy is shown with the date engraved allegedly in 1566. At first glance, the Latin letter I in the beginning of the date can be taken as a unit, but if you look closely, we can clearly see that it does not figure as a capital letter I. It's exactly the same as in the passage from right here. See the identical. This is a letter. This is a letter. This is not a unit of measuring time. Old German handwriting text, 566 years of Christmas. Here's another one. You can see how the let this letter here matches the letters right here. Here and here. That's 664, year of Christ, year of Christmas. So, same with this one. All right. So, so in that video, again, you saw more examples of the dating system being not the I for a thousand but for Jesus Christ 600 years after Jesus Christ 500 years after Jesus Christ and the Gregorian calendar coming about in 582 suddenly blurred the lines and then now we are several hundred years after that but because of the spirit of Antichrist changing times and laws, I believe a thousand years have been added right in the middle of our timeline. The Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, where nobody knows what happened. All of a sudden, after the fall of Rome in 464 AD, Mankind went on a thousand years of disease and pestilence and fighting each other in wars with no development. And then all of a sudden, the Renaissance came. That's what history tells you. But what I think is more likely is when the fall of Rome came, then all these other countries became more bold in their exploration, developed more wealth to build up cities within their borders. And the Renaissance came on pretty quickly after that. There was no thousand years of dark ages. It went immediately from 
the fall of Rome to a lot of other countries becoming prominent, developing art, culture, exploration, you name it. Um, so for example, we learn in our history books that Christopher Columbus came to America in 1492. But what I think happened was Christopher Columbus came to America in 492. After the fall of Rome, the Spaniards commissioned him a few decades later to explore, and he came to America. So let me show you a few other things that I found, because I did some research of my own. And I want to show you a few coins that I found. Um, we'll start here. Here's a coin that people will say is from 1606. But look at it. It's the year of the Lord, 606. That's an I. That's not a one. Um, you know, you see, you see an I right here within the alphabet. And show another one. Here, this is dated 1618, according to the historians and archaeologists, this authentic Spanish coin. But look at the I here. And look at this. This is 618, and this is a I for Isis, Jesus, you're the Lord, 618 years after Christ. These two digits are different. That's an I, and that's their one at that time. They're different. This is bolder. This is space more. That's not 1618. And here's a German coin. And, you know, she briefly talked about the eyes being uh, different. Actually, what I think this is, is a J for Jesus. The letter J became introduced into our alphabet, the English alphabet, and in a lot of other cultures' alphabet. Um, in the late 1500s, early 1600s, most people give credit to the letter J to the Frenchman Pierre Ramus in the late 1500s. And then after that, culture started adopting the letter J into their alphabet. And so there are a lot of documents that I've looked at and a lot of coins I've looked at at about this period of time when the letter I was changed into a letter J. So here, I think it's 687 years after Jesus with a J. Now that that culture, that era, that generation had adopted the J into their alphabet. Um, and that, you know, briefly brings me back to the Gregorian calendar introduced in what historians will tell you is 1582, which I think it was 582, uh, and that we're living in maybe 1018, not 2018, give or take a few years, um, since Christ. But the Gregorian calendar, most, most people didn't adopt it. They hated it. And it was only with force did different countries adopt the Gregorian calendar. For instance, most Catholic countries went along with Pope Gregory the 13th when he made the change. Uh, France, for instance, um, you know, Poland, Portugal, Spain, but there are other countries that didn't. 
Germany, for instance, didn't adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1700. And this is a German coin before what we know as 1700. And so they haven't adopted the Gregorian calendar. They still date their as 687 years after Jesus Christ on their coins here. Um, and just of note, Great Britain didn't adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1752. And there was some countries that didn't adopt the Gregorian calendar until the 18 or even 1900s. Um, for instance, Russia didn't adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1918, um, with Turkey the last to do so in 1926. Again, this is not 1687. This is 687 after Jesus Christ. But enough about coins. The last thing I want to show you is historical documents. And you know with this being a channel pointing to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truths of the Bible, you know which documents I wanted to really check out to see if these things were so. I'm being a Berean in the truest sense when it comes to chronology here. Let's look at the different Bibles that came about in the 1500s before the adoption of the Gregorian calendar until the King James Bible in 1611. And let's see what it looks like. We'll start with the Tyndale Bible. And this is a cover of the Tyndale Bible in 1536. And you can see right here, that is not a one. That's an I for 536 years after Jesus or Isis. It's an I, it's different font, it's different size than the numerical uh, then the numbers here, 536. This is not 1536 on the Tyndale Bible here. Let's look at the next one. This is the Great Bible, 1539. And let's look at it here. Again, that is an I. That's not a one. This is 539 years after Isis, after Jesus. Let's continue. The Geneva Bible. This is a 1599 version of the New Testament cover of the Geneva Bible, printed in London. And you can see here, that is not a one. That is an I for Isis. That is 599 years after Jesus. You can see here, our Lord Isis, the J was not adopted into the English language in 1599 in London by this copier. It hadn't come about yet. It was right at that stage in the early 1600s of being adopted. But at this printing, the J's were still pronounced I's. They were still I's, Isis. And you can see that throughout um, here. But again, this is not 1599. Let's go to the Dewey Reams. And you know, this is a New Testament copy of the Dewey Reams. And if we go down to the bottom, Printed at Reims by John Fogney. You can see the J is an I there. You see right below it. That's an I. That's not, that's not a one. This is 582 years after Isis, after Jesus, that this Bible was printed. And you can even see right here. I don't know if you can see this, but there's an I and then there's a one right there by the eight, that's, different. that's a different font than this. 
So, let's go to the King James Bible, circa 1611. So there's going to be a lot of ones in this, so let's see what it looks like. Um, let me pull it up. Here is the cover of the King James Bible, Anno Domini 1611, and if we blow it up, that's an eye. Six, one, and this is what's interesting, confusing. This is a Roman numeral I, R, the letter I. This is different. That's a different font than this. But then you have this that looks kind of like this, but also looks like a smaller version of the I. So, you know, I can't say for a fact this is absolutely a one and this is absolutely a one, this is absolutely an eye right here um, because the lines are blurred a little bit. But what I do see is that this is clearly an eye and this is clearly distinct from the first digit of this four digit number, which I think is a three digit number with the letter I preceding it. So I think this very well could be really good evidence that the Bible, that we're taught was printed the first edition of the King James in 1611 to actually be in 611 after Christ. Still just 400 years or so from now, but not 1611 years from Christ. It's much closer. You know, we know that the and I'll go back to full screen here just to finish, but we know that the Bible was written by holy men of God and scribes copied it exactly. And there were copies going throughout the known world after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And by 300 AD, there had been many, many, many thousands of copies of the majority text coming out of Antioch. Now, there was a minority text coming out of Alexandria, which we have the modern Bible trans perversions. That's a whole nother topic. But history shows that by 500 AD, there were over 500 languages that the Bible had been translated into. And so my point here is that there wasn't this thousand years of dark ages where people all of a sudden didn't have a Bible and didn't know God and didn't know the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the world wants you to think. You know, the Catholic Church in 600 AD began to push the Latin Vulgate on everybody and try to take Bibles from the common people. But what I want to show you here is that the Tyndale Bible and the Great Bible, you know, we didn't even look at the Bishop's Bible. And I should have showed you that. It shows the same thing. The Geneva Bible, um, the Dewey Reams, all the way up to the King James. These were coming about at a time when the English language was beginning to explode and everybody had the true word of God. Um, everybody knew the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world will tell you differently that there's a thousand years in between. And all that does is cast doubt that, you know, the world is going to put as much time, you know, distance from the Word of God in mankind as it can. This is the spirit of Antichrist uh, doing this. You know, it, 
it wants to dis the spirit of antichrist wants to distance mankind from the word of god 